don't we get started um, at this uh, UBC Masters of Business Analytics Career Outcomes Information Session. So this session, um, I will have a session where we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the MBAN program as well as um, career, as well as admission requirements and such. But we will also have this event focused on um, career outcomes from the UBC Masters of Business Analytics program. Now, before we start with the formal session, please do note that this session is being recorded. So um, feel free to um, read kind of the full um, description of this recording and, and what it means. If you don't feel comfortable being recorded, please do keep your um, video feeds off um, so, um, so that you don't get recorded inadvertently. Um, great. So um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We would also like to acknowledge that you're joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Um, so in the room today, my name is Vivian Tran, and I'm a, a manager of recruitment and admissions at the Robert H. Lee Graduate School, the UBC Sauter School of Business. And um, I do take the um, kind of lead on the Masters of Business Analytics program, as well as the MBA plus MBAN dual degree program. Now with me, I have our special guest, um, Joyce Wong, who is a career strategist uh, with the Hari B. Varshney Business Career Center at UBC Sauter. Um, maybe Joyce, you can give a wave. Great. Um, so thanks, Joyce, for joining us. And uh, just and we also have a few members of our recruitment and admissions team kind of in the background, just making sure everything goes smoothly. So um, I, I won't name them because they've already they're um, they're kind of like in the background right now. But um, know that you can ask questions um, during the session. Please, when you're asking questions, use the Q&A because that's an easier way for us to track your questions and answer them. Now, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please feel free to pop those into the chat so we know it's more of a technical difficulty rather than a question about the session or the substantive matter about the session. So great, so we have a full component of team members here to help us both on the live um, webinar as well as in the background if you have any questions or issues. Um, so just an agenda about how today's session will go. Um, we're gonna start with um, an MBAN program overview uh, first and then we're gonna go into Joyce's career outcomes presentation. Um, and then we will, of course, leave time for Q&A for both myself and Joyce at the end of the session. But during the session, do feel free to pop your questions into the Q&A and we will answer them in the order that they came in on. So thanks, everyone. Um, let's get started with the um, MBAN program overview. Um, so a little bit about UBC itself. Um, so UBC is one of the top 40 universities in the world. Um, so it is a it's a center of thought leadership innovation and research um, globally. So when you join UBC Sauter, you're not just joining a business school, um, a top ranked business school in Canada, but you're also joining um, a, a global institute of um, thought leadership and innovation. So that's something that um, will be globally recognized in terms of the credential that you get, and also um, an ability to connect with an alumni network of 300,000 UBC alumni in 140 countries around the world, and then the Sauter network of around 40,000 alumni in about 80 countries around the world. So it is um, uh, a top-notch um, global institution um, that is recognized around the world as um, um, a center of innovation. So a little bit about Vancouver. So for those of you joining us from all over the world, it, it stands to, I, I feel like it's worth um, kind of indicating that Vancouver is actually the warmest place in Canada. So sometimes when I say I'm from Canada, you just imagine that I'm in a snowsuit every day and it's covered in snow. In fact, it very much looks a lot like this photo that you see here. And, and this photo behind me is one of my favorite images of the campus itself. Um, you know, on a sunny day, it is uh, it's, it's beauty that's otherworldly, in my opinion. It is just a beautiful place to be, and it is one of the most livable cities in North America um, by various rankings, and Canada's fastest growing metropolitan um, economy. That's home to a number of different um, enterprises, both large and small. You know, we've got large tech firms like Microsoft here, as well as um, McKinsey. Um, we also have born in Vancouver um, companies like Lululemon, um, and of course, like different types of um, governmental organizations like the city of Vancouver um, as well. So um, a range of different industries that you can tap into when you're part of the Vancouver economy and part of the Vancouver business ecosystem. 
Um, a little bit about the MBAN program journey now. So it, the MBAN program starts in August of every year with a cohort of about 100 students, and they're always divided into about two classrooms. So you always have a good um, kind of small size um, teacher to student ratio, about no more than 50 students to a professor. Um, so you get that good interaction with your peers as well as your professors. Now, the program is 12 months long and it, you can see it's quite an intensive training program in business analytics. So you can see the courses that you're gonna be doing kind of listed here. So every five weeks or so, you're gonna be shuffling into like four different types of an business analytics courses. Um, and in between these um, kind of five week cycles, you're gonna be doing thematic courses on things like data visualization, business immersion, data-driven marketing. And then these green elements here, those are kind of the career components. So one of the most important things that we want, obviously, that you are joining us for um, or interested for in doing the MBAN program are the career outcomes. So this is why we have a session like today and, and Joyce is going to be the expert that's going to answer a lot more of these questions. But you can see that it like the career development programming, it runs throughout the length of the program. And there's also elements of it that happen during the program, like the hackathon, where you actually do like a project for like, you know, a, a business analytics based project for, you know, one of our um, company uh, partners. Like I think this year it was Google Cloud, which was very exciting. So it's a great way for you to work on, you know, real life business problems and showcase your work to some of our industry partners. Now, a big highlight of our, our program is this four month paid internship. So now there is an opportunity to also do um, like a personal research project, which Joyce is going to talk about in um, in more detail during her presentation. But this is also a big highlight about the experiential learning component of the MBAN program is this um, four month um, analytics consulting internship where um, you can work with a real company and um, really explore an, maybe a new company, new industry and apply those um, skills that you've been learning um, for the eight months prior in the MBAN program to an actual job setting. So I'll leave that um, to Joyce to explain in more detail um, during her presentation, but that is essentially the program journey. So 12 months, very um, intense um, and um, with a lot of experiential components um, built into the, um, the hard learning that you're going to be doing in business analytics. Now, some of you might be interested in the MBA plus MBAN dual degree. So essentially this program um, combines our MBA program with our, our MBAN um, program. So um, basically how it will work is the first 12 months of the dual degree program will be the MBA curriculum. Um, so 12 months from August to August um, will be MBA, um, including the MBA internship, the four month MBA internship. And then the next 12 months will be the MBAN component. So the 12 months that I just reviewed with you um, will happen in the next year of the program. So it's a two-year dual degree program, MBA first and the MBAN next with two um, four-month uh, internships involved. So um, for those of you that are interested, feel free to pop questions in the q and I'd be more than happy to answer those questions. But I just wanted to go briefly there about the um, dual degree program as well. Admission requirements. Um, so I won't talk too deeply about this um, because all the information is here as well as on our website, but essentially a B plus average. And I'm going to show you a slide where you can see how you can translate that from your home degrees. Um, and then uh, standardized tests, um, unless you qualify for a waiver. And I will talk about the waiver in just a second. But essentially for a competitive um, you know, uh, requirement, we're going to be looking for a GMAT in the competitive range of 650 or higher or 605 plus for the new GMAT focus exam. Um, or a GRE, a competitive standard will be um, 330, uh, 330. Now we also have minimum requirements. So like minimum to be considered you know, a valid application, you would need a 550 on the GMAT or a 310 or higher on the GRE as minimum requirements. There's no professional, uh, no minimum professional experience required. So you can come to us with, you know, directly from an undergraduate degree, or you can come with 15, 20 years of work experience. Um, there, it's really like a training program that is suitable for people that are ready for this injection of knowledge, right? And how they apply it will depend on, you know, where they are in their career and where they where they end up, um, you know, getting employment after they graduate will be, be based largely on kind of their previous experience and how they're going to apply this new knowledge that they gain from the NBAN degree. So it's suitable for people from all different backgrounds, um, but it just depends on what where you're coming from in terms of what types of jobs you end up um, attaining for yourself after you graduate. Minimum of two references. So ideally, if you've been working, ideally one from somewhere that you reported directly to, either in a current or a previous position. 
Um, and then the second one can be like a colleague that you worked with, or if you were an entrepreneur, it could be a client or a supplier, for example. If you don't have any work experience, um, you can feel free to use a co-op supervisor if you have co-op experience, or you can use an academic reference from a professor as well. Um, there's a variety of written and video essays. Um, they're quite short, so you do want to be concise and answer the question, but also don't be too generic. Like, you know, you want to really reflect on who you are and what your goals are this program. Uh, what your goals are for this program, what your career goals are, why you picked this program. So in those essay questions, you want to reflect on those elements that are not too generic. Like, I don't want to read your essay question and think like, I could have figured, I could have written that with like, just looking at the website, right? You want to be able to reflect on yourself and what your goals are. Um, English proficiency test is only required if you did not do your first degree in English. So uh, the medium of instruction at the institution, if it is English, then in that case, the English test is waived. Further questions about that, feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, but if you do have to write the English test, then we're looking for an IELTS academic with an average of a seven or a TOEFL with an average of a hundred. Personal interview is the last stage of the process. So that's a 30 to 45 minute interview. Um, we're not trying to trick you or anything like that. We're just trying to get to know you better and to fill any um, gaps of our knowledge about you that doesn't show through in maybe the submitted paper application. So, you know, there's a lot that you can say about yourself through your documents that you submit, through your essays, but, you know, rounding everything out with the interview is just our way of kind of understanding you a little bit better and, and answering any questions that might still be unanswered from looking at your application. All right. Now, a lot of you guys had that question about the grades, like what if I did um, my degree at another country? Um, how do I translate that to the B plus average? Feel free to screenshot this page or um, just, um, you know, uh, scan this QR code. That would take you to a page where you can select the country where you did your degree from and see what that B plus equivalent is. Now, a lot of you guys also have questions about what is a GMAT waiver? So if you guys, if you come from a strong academic background and you have some quantitative courses in your um, transcript and they are also pretty strong, um, then you might be eligible for a waiver of the GMAT or GRE test um, requirement. Now, this is not automatic. Now, there's a few requirements here that I'll leave you to either screenshot um, or, you know, take a photo of, um, but, you know, bachelor's degree with a minimum B plus average, for example, or four or more quantitative courses courses and those quantitative courses also have to have a B plus average or higher, right? That can be a, qualif a qualification point. Another could be a CFA two level um, pass. And of course, a bachelor or master's degree with a minimum academic average of B plus or higher or a PhD. So I'll leave you to review this. Now, just keep in mind, very importantly, you must submit with a complete application by January 9th in order for us to assess you for the GMAT or GRE waiver. So it's not like you send us these documents and we assess for a GMAT GRE waiver. You actually need to submit a fully complete application, references in, everything in, before we assess for the GMAT GRE waiver eligibility. Now, if you're not um, qualified for it, we will contact you. We'll put your application on hold. So your application is not invalidated if you're not qualified for this. It will just be put on hold and we will contact you and let you know you need to write the tests. So those are common questions that I get. So I just wanted to tell that to you now because I know that it's probably top of mind for a lot of you. For the questions about that, again, put on the chat. I also put the eligibility requirements for the MBA plus MBAN dual degree here. You can see they're slightly different owing primarily to the fact that you basically do the MBA first. So if you did well in the MBA, we we're relatively assured that you're gonna be, do well on the MBAN as well. So you can see there's slight differences in the qualification requirements for the waiver for the MBA plus MBAN dual degree. I'll leave you guys to take a photo of this or scan the QR code to get um, the qualification requirements um, directly. Um, and just a little bit of note, like in addition to like requesting the waiver, you're, you're going to have to submit a, a statement of qualification. So I'll leave you guys to take a photo of this just to like get an, a sense of what we're looking for when we, we talk about this 250 word statement of qualification for the um, application for a GMAT GRA waiver. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll leave that with you guys. And um, let's move on to scholarships, which I know you guys are all interested in. Again, that January 9th deadline is very, very important. Um, if you apply with a complete application before our January 9th deadline, you may be eligible for consideration for scholarships up to full tuition um, for all regions of the world. So these are some of our kind of our lar large prominent scholarships for the, um, that uh, January 9th deadline. And of course, January 9th is very significant for those of you that are also applying for waivers, for test waivers. Um, so do keep that January 9th, uh, 9th deadline in mind. Now, one point 
point about the, the, the waivers, like if you are applying for a GMAT GRE waiver, I, I suggest you apply early, like you reach for our October 17th deadline instead, just because if you're not writing a test already and you think you might qualify for like a waiver, um, it just gives you that much more time if for some reason the waiver is not accepted to then have enough time to write the test before the January 9th deadline. So keep in mind, like if the waiver is not accepted, your application is still considered incomplete. So you still need to make that January 9th deadline to be considered for these larger scholarships. So that's why I would say if you are applying for a standardized test waiver, apply early, apply in our October deadline so that there's just that much more time. If we do tell you that you don't meet the waiver requirements, that you have that much more time to write the test. Great. Um, these are our deadlines here. Like I said, the October 17th deadline, the first round deadline is coming up. And I would suggest that for anybody applying with um, consideration for a GMAT GRA waiver, um, just because like in the case that it is not accepted, then you just have that much more time to write the test between October and January um, to get a valid test score to be eligible for some of those large um, regional scholarships that I showed there. Um, and then get to know us, you know, continue coming to these events, um, you know, refine your mission statement for the MBAN program. The more you get to know us through coming to events, coming to our Ask Me Anything sessions, um, booking a session with some of our current students in the MBAN program, the more you're going to be able to write those essays um, with a voice that shows that you understand what you're getting into, you have clear goals, and you just make yourself that much more competitive for the program. So come out to more of these events, um, be in contact with us if you have any questions, and, and learn more. Um, so um, thank you for coming to this event and listening to this part of the session. I will leave this now with Joyce. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's so great to see so many people around the world joining us um, today for the career outcomes and employment trends for our MBANs. My name is Joyce Wong, and I am a career strategist working with the specialty master's careers team at the Hari B. Varshney Career Center, located right in the Sauter School of Business. The specialty master's careers team look after a number of graduate programs, including master's of business analytics, master's of management, and our dual program bachelor plus master's management. So in the short little while, we're going to be looking um, at what is the Business Career Center. Uh, we're going to look at the class of 2023 profile um, and the internship data. Then we're going to look at the 2023 and 2022 full-time hire data. And we're going to end my session with the BC labor market outlook. So the Business Career Center is your home for career development services at UBC Sauter. There are only a few faculties within UBC that have their own career center and Sauter is one of them. So how can the BCC help you? First, uh, you can book career coaching and advising one-on-one -on -one sessions with our career managers. We also have career development resources that are um, developed and created um, at the BCC. Um, some include um, our tailored toolkits, which look after um, networking, how to build resumes, cover letters, uh, negotiating salary, and much more. We also have the job and experiential learning and opportunities, as well as employer and alumni events. Here, I want to take a, a, a minute to recognize um, in the BCC, we have a team called the Business Development Team. They are our employer facing. Um, colleagues at the BCC, and their main job is to go out and connect with employers um, and tell them about our solder graduate programs, solder programs, as well as our talented students. And from there, employers will book company info sessions, recruiting sessions, join our career fairs, uh, join our employer networking events, um, and also post jobs and internship, whether it be internship or full-time jobs, on our um, job board, um, which we call COOL. We also have skill development workshop. So as you noticed in Vivian's slide, um, there's career development courses throughout your program. And so uh, there is a course called BA 520 and th that encompasses 10 different classes and they're all towards our skill development workshop that's delivered by the BCC, by the career managers like myself and my colleagues. Um, and so, um, the BCC is here to help you and there's so many resources here. Um, so you will not be alone. Um, so here's a quick snapshot of our specialty master's careers team. It's led by Martina. She's the assistant dean and she looks after the whole entire business career center. 
Then we have Lane McDonald and we have Pam Nansen. Pam Nansen looks after the specialty master's careers team. And with myself, we have Carly and Logan as career managers. So between the three of us, we look after all specialty master's um, programs. So like I said, master's of business analytics, master's management, and our dual program, bachelor and master's of management. And every year we're lucky enough to have a co-op project coordinator join us. And this is where we have Layla who's supporting our team. And I definitely wanna make sure that you know the faces of the business development team. So these are the individuals that are our employer facing uh, colleagues at the BCC. Each business development manager looks after specific industries. Um, and so their main role again is to go out and connect with many different organizations within the industries that they're looking after to ensure they know about our solder programs and the talents that uh, comes out from our solder programs like yourself. So at the BCC, we follow this career development model known as my unique career journey. No matter where you are in your unique career journey, you can use this model to help navigate your personal and professional goals at UBC Solder and beyond. So as you can see, there are four pillars. And as you move through your unique career journey, you can jump between these four pillars to support your own development. When you join the MBAM program, we do ask that you are committed, you are proactive, and that you are resilient. And what that means is when you're being committed, your career is your journey. The BCC is here to help, but the drive and effort comes from you. When we say be proactive, UBC Solder and the Business Career Center will provide opportunities for you to learn, grow, and connect with career enhancing experiences. It's up to you though, to engage and capitalize on them. And finally, being resilient. Um, for many of you, you'll be moving from your country to a new place. Um, so as you can imagine, change, there's lots of change. So in your career paths, you will often in, um, encompass change. And so embrace this change with confidence and know that you have the support system at the UBC Solder to help you navigate through these transitions. So I wanted to take some time to talk about our MBAN internship data, um, but also the profile of our most recent class of 2023. So this past year, we have 78 students in total, 54% male and 46% female, and 82% were international students with 18% domestic. The average age is about 26 and average years of work experience is four years. On the bottom, you can see that uh, the undergraduate studies that uh, these students, the 78 students were in prior to joining the program, the MBAN program, and if, for those who have work experience, these are some of the industries uh, they that they worked in prior to joining the MBAN program. Vivian earlier mentioned also um, about the internship, the four months between May and August, um, that you get to participate in an experiential learning portion of the program. So there is two routes. You can go through the personal research project or you can go through the traditional internship. For the personal research project, it is an independent analytics project that you create and propose. So students will come up with a problem or a question and they will lead um, how they will find the solution to that problem or that question. For the traditional internship, this is where students work with a company in an analytics focused position. So regardless of whether or not you do a personal research project or the traditional internship, it does need to touch upon at least one of the areas in the green boxes that you see there. Reason being is these are the, the um, analytics focused um, topics that you'll be learning throughout your MBAM program in the eight months prior. And the experiential learning really is an opportunity for you to put uh, what you learn in the classroom into real life situations and scenarios. So this past summer, um, 68 of the 78 students um, picked and got the opportunity to work with a company uh, where the role is analytics focused. We had about 10 students. Well, we did have 10 students who decided to do the personal research project, which is the independent analytics project that they created and proposed. For both streams, you would have the um, opportunity and you will be assigned a faculty supervisor. So the faculty supervisor is there to guide and support and answer any questions you have and make sure you're on the right track. Of the internships of the 68 students that landed an internship, majority of these students did stay here in BC, 85% of them. We had 4% who went to Alberta, 
We had 9% that went to um, Toronto, Ontario, and then we had 2% in New Brunswick. Um, for the New Brunswick, 2%, the students did not actually go to New Brunswick to work. Uh, the headquarters of the organization was in New Brunswick, but they had the opportunity to work fully remotely here in BC. So here are some internship postings data um, that was created by the Business Career Center. What that means is our business development team um, went out and sourced these jobs and posted on our job board at the BCC, uh, known as COOL. Here you can see that we had um, about 682 opportunities posted. That equates to 8.7 postings per student. You will also notice that from September to January, there were 340 internships posted. This is when the bigger multinational posts for consulting, finance, and other cyclical internships. So the key here is to activate early. As you can see, 340 of the 682, that's almost half of all the job postings came up in the first quarter um, of the program. And here are some information about the postings by industries. What I want to note is that consulting, finance, and technology, um, for this current year, we have, saw, uh, we have seen and heard from these industries that um, they are slowing down or what they call right sizing right now. So for this current year, um, there are a fewer um, positions in consulting, finance, and technology. But of course, this is not to say that this is going to happen continually into next year and the years to come. Um, but just as of right now, they are right sizing. Healthcare and retail is continually uh, going strong right now. Next, I wanted to showcase um, some of the internship uh, companies um, sorry, it's companies that hired our interns um, and also some of the roles that our students um, had during their internships. So as you can see, um, some of these uh, logos are the same ones that um, Vivian shared in earlier um, slides. Uh, Lululemon is right here, uh, created and uh, from here in Vancouver, um, and there's lots of opportunities there. Um, for our MBAN 2023 full-time hires. So these are the students that just completed their internship in August. Some are still lingering, meaning they're still finishing uh, their internship, um, but the program is finished, but some internships do last a little longer. So they just need to, uh, before they graduate or before the program ends, they do need to complete at least eight weeks of the internship. So when students complete their program, we do ask them to self-report to let us know um, their post-program um, intentions, whether they're planning to look for jobs or if they have landed uh, full-time jobs already, or if they're planning to put a hold in uh, looking for roles because they're looking to travel or taking some time off, or they might want to uh, continue with further studies. So this is just a snapshot in time right now. Uh, so these are some of the companies that have hired our graduating class of 2023, and our students are currently working for these uh, industries and companies. Uh, and these are some of the job titles that they are holding right now. Uh, so I wanted to give you a fuller picture. So I thought I'd share um, the class of 2022 full-time hires with you. So the class size for, last, um, for a class of 2022 was 65. Of the 65 students, 62 reported that they were actively seeking for full-time work. And as of um, February 2023, which is six months after the program completion, not graduation, but the program completion, which is end of August, 57 were hired, which is 92%. So those are really good stats, statistics um, for the class of 2022. The median salary is 82,000 for this group of um, 57 that were hired, and the average sal salary was 90,353. 90, and again, these are some of the companies that hired them full-time and some of the job titles um, that our students or our alumni are holding right now. And finally, just wanna take a few minutes here to um, talk about the BC labor market outlook uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, this is the 22, 22 edition. In BC, the labor market is expected to have over a million job openings in the next 10 years. And of those million job openings, 63% uh, will be um, a result of replacement. What that means is the population labor continue to age and employers will need to replace the retiring workers. So 63% of the job openings will be replaced um, aging workers that permanently leave the workforce. 37 expansion 
our 37% of job openings will be from newly created jobs through economic growth and to a lesser extent through the recovery from COVID-19 um, pandemic. So how is BC going to fill these jobs? The forecast is that 47% will be filled by young people starting work, 38% by immigrants, 8% from migrants from other provinces in Canada, and an 8% uh, supply shortage to be addressed through increased labor force participation and innovation. Here in BC and in Canada, uh, the government do have certain incentives to attract um, people to certain industry and certain jobs when they are having a hard time um, fulfilling those um, opportunities. And within BC, this is kind of where the million jobs are going to um, take place in the next 10 years. So as you can see, majority of them will be here in Vancouver, Lower Mainland. Uh, the runner up is on the island, which is absolutely beautiful. And then our interior in Okanagan. So lots of different opportunities around BC that will be coming up in the next 10 years. And here you can see kind of the top ind growth industries, healthcare and social assistance, and as well as professional scientific and technical services. In all these areas, there are a lot of um, opportunities uh, related to data, um, analytics, business analytics. Uh, so there's a, this is really a great time um, if you're thinking of joining, um, you know, coming back to school or changing, pivoting careers um, and coming for the Masters of Business Analytics um, because um, there is no shortage in jobs for um, this this field and this um, this technical skills. Thanks so much, Joyce, for that wonderful presentation. So um, we're going to ask now, like, just open everything up to questions. So if you ever had questions about career outcomes or um, the internship, this is a golden opportunity to ask um, Joyce from the Business Career Center. I see we already have some questions in the Q&A. So I'd ask you to continue to put your questions in the Q&A that allows us to track these questions better and answer in the order that they were received. So um, i I'm gonna start asking you some of the questions I see. Okay, so uh, Joyce, there's a question for you. As the program starts in um, basically fall of 2024, when is the best time to apply for internships? Fantastic question. So based on the slides I showed where the job postings, majority of the job postings came up for class of 2023, which was from September to um, January, I would say start right away. Of course, if you're you know getting used to coming back to school and getting used to the environment here in Vancouver and uh, the program, I would say continue to think about the internship, but I wouldn't want to add the extra stress because as you can see in that slide, uh, there are jobs throughout uh, the coming months from September all the way to uh, when the internship starts. We just ask that you activate early. Um, and as mentioned earlier, um, in the beginning, um, September to January, majority of the jobs are consulting finance and so and new grad programs. So if those are areas that you really want uh, when you graduate, then you definitely want to pay attention to that. We do have a lot of local companies that start hiring just in time. Um, so what that means is when they see a need, they want to hire and then they'll post jobs with us. And those usually come out um, in the new year, so January onwards. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, going on, I do see another question that's career related. So this participant asks, I have a clear objective of joining the course um, to become a business analyst in consulting firms like the MBB or Big Four. So does this course help for that? Since I don't see any outcomes shown in the presentation, which I think I actually did see some um, internships at Deloitte, but I'll allow you to answer that question, Joyce. Yeah, absolutely. So no, we do have uh, a number of students that go into uh, consulting, whether that be for internship or full time jobs. So we do in class of 2022, we do have uh, students that went to BCG as well as McKinsey. Uh, this current year, I know that we had a lot of students that went to EY, Deloitte, um, even Deloitte Omnia AI, um, KPMG. Um, let me see which other one, MPW, um, actually not PwC, but no, we, we do have a lot of um, MBAN alumni um, and MBAN students that go into the internships in consulting. So uh, definitely it will help. If consulting is something of interest, um, you do want to start um, networking and um, practicing those case interviews um, because those interviews are earlier on in the program. Mm -hmm. That's great. And um, just 
So we basically have examples from MBB and from Big Four, so that's excellent. And just a question for you, Joyce, like with the ones that went to the MBBs, did they have involvement with the SCMP program at um, UBC or did they just land by themselves with the MBBs? Yeah, absolutely. I believe one of them did do the SCMP um, mm -hmm. and the other one, I'm not really sure, um, but yes, yes. And hey. I have students from this year that did join and they said they highly recommend both the SCMP MP, as well as SCI. Okay, awesome. So I'll just put some resources here in the chat in case people would like to know about this SCMP program. And I can pull the uh, resource for SCI like just in a second. But basically SCMP, maybe Joyce, you can explain it a, a little bit better than me. Like it's like a four weekend boot camp, um, basically focused on like the case interview, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe that. I believe so. Um, I should have more information, but I don't. But yes, I believe that is the case. But we can definitely put more information so that the students can start looking into it. Um, the SCI usually um, the recruiting period is now for this current year. So for next year program for class of 2025, uh, you'll be able to apply into the SCI in the beginning mm -hmm. of um September. Um, and for the SCI, um, it just provides you a lot of opportunity. I'm thinking it's the same as the SCMP. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of opportunities for networking and connecting with people in the industry, and obviously to brush up on the, all the different skills that you might need for the interview and for the job itself. Yeah, so these are like extracurricular um, aspects that you can join when you're a part of the program. And so maybe you can speak a little bit about that, Joyce, like this program is highly um, academic. And so, you know, it's it's pretty intensive, but maybe you can speak to the importance of getting yourself out there and joining some of these extracurricular activities that the BCC has done such a great job of, of hosting and providing opportunities for, for students to engage in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would highly recommend um, the fall is the busiest time for our company info sessions and recruiting sessions. And so I always encourage students, including the current cohort that just joined us, is um, even if you have a really strong idea as to where you want to go, still be open and join the different company info sessions just to learn, especially if you're new to Vancouver or new to North America, just to understand the market here and, um, and of the different industries and organizations and how they run. And um, because all of this will help you have a better idea of where you want to go, but it will also help you in your interview, um, just knowing the lingo and um, understanding the company culture because you've heard it and seen seen it. Um, so definitely, these are all um, areas that the BCC support. Uh, so I highly recommend that as well as the career center that is put on by UBC. Um, that's actually happening today and yesterday. And so there's lots going on on campus that um, is here to support you, especially if you're new to Vancouver and just introducing you to um, all the different uh, um, business leaders and um, business community. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say was um, Vivian mentioned about the hackathon. So the hackathon isn't mandatory, but again, this is something that um, B BCC help puts on. And so going back to what uh, Vivian was saying, get involved, join the hackathon. It's an opportunity for you to work really closely with a specific uh, organization um, and really put your um, skill set uh, to work. And it, it could be something that you can add to your portfolio so that you can uh, showcase when you're going for interviews, showcasing what you were able to do um, in the hackathon. Um, there's also lots of case competitions that happen, whether that is put on by the BCC or just um, that, that is put on by different organizations. Um, so just being open and um, embracing all the opportunities are, are basically at your fingertips. Hey, thanks so much for that, Joyce. I'm going to give you a tiny bit of a break because I see some questions on admissions <laughs> coming in. So um, let's let's just get through some of these before we throw it back to Joyce. And again, please keep those uh, career outcome questions coming in the um, Q&A because we're going to circle back to Joyce in just a, a moment. Um, so I have one question here. If my references are not submitted within the round one deadline, will my application be moved to the next round? So that's a good question. So the round one deadline is October 17th. So it, the, when we say 
completed application, it means everything needs to be in, including the references. This is why I always recommend that if you're reaching for one of these deadlines, um, please like do, don't do it right at the deadline. Do like go two weeks ahead, one week ahead. That way, if something is missing, like you know, you'll be aware of it and be able to remedy in time before the deadline comes. Right. So if you don't make that deadline, it will be considered like let's say a reference is missing. You're technically considered for the next round deadline. All right. So. Um, not as big of a deal with like October 17th. We don't have a lot of major scholarships associated with the first round, but especially with that January 9th deadline, that is our deadline for um, GMAT GRE waivers, as well as for the, some of those large regional scholarships. So that's something you really want to be aware of. Okay, so um, someone has a question about the recommendation letter, specifically academic references. Are there particular subject and or areas of studies that would be most relevant or beneficial for the MBAN program? So in the case that maybe you're a new grad and you don't really have a lot of work experience references, you can use a um, academic reference. In that case, ideally, it's like a professor that knows you well. And ideally, it's a professor more from a quantitative discipline. But like if let's say you're in a class of like a thousand, like 700 people and that prof doesn't really know you very well, then you can use a different prof. You know, it doesn't have to be a certain subject matter. The more important thing is that they can actually speak to your potential academically and what they foresee for you in the future as well in your work ethic. So like if ideally it's a quantitative subject matter, but again, if it's one of those classes where like they don't know you well, then feel free to use like a different prof. Um, if the GMAT waiver is not considered for in case GMAT waiver is not considered, will we have ample time to prepare and give the exam? How early can the confirmation on the waiver if we apply in October um, 2023? That's a good question, um, Jiraj. Like if, so this, the reason why I say, if you want to apply with consideration for a GMAT or GRE waiver to apply very early, like even before our first round deadline, like as soon as possible, essentially, is that it will take us a couple of weeks to go through your application to actually do the assessment. Um, it's, done, it's done on a uh, academic, but also on a holistic basis. So, um, you know, like the sooner you you submit, the more likely that if you don't get it granted, um, that you still, you know, have as much time as you need before the next deadline comes um, to write the exam. So this is a lot of this is going to be self-driven, right? Like the sooner you apply, the more time you give yourself. Um, not so much um, on our end, but we usually try to like inform candidates within a few weeks, um, you know, in the case that like we did the GPA calculation and we did an assessment and it's it's not eligible for the waiver, that you will, you will know, um, you know, soon at, from the time that you submitted your application, not so much that we're giving you more time before the deadline, because that's more self-driven on your part to apply early. Hope that answers your question. So the earlier you apply, if you want to apply for a GMAT GRE waiver, the more advantageous for yourself. And then regarding professional references, are there specific areas or competencies that you recommend the professional referee comment or align better with the program requirements? So I guess when you're, you, you know, you want to definitely have a conversation with your references about your intention to do the MBAN program. You know, that's a really good conversation to have. Like, it's just, it's someone that you you know well, you respect. And so it's just a good conversation to have about like, this is additional education I want to do. And like, these are the career outcomes that I'm hoping to achieve. So, you know, like, it's a good conversation to have. It's a good conversation for you to kind of like remind them of like, maybe any like work achievements that you've had, um, you know, like what your intentions are so that when they are formulating their responses to the reference questions, that they keep these things in mind. So, um, like the, the reference letter, it's not really just like a letter that they just kind of like write free form and send to us. It's actually like a form that is sent to them by email. So as soon as basically this is how it works, like in your application, as soon as you submit their name and email and you hit submit on that, it automatically sends them the form. So it actually sends them the form before you even submit your application. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind with your references. It doesn't wait till you submit your application to send them the form, just because we know it can take a, a while for them to receive the form. So um, when they look, when they see the form, it's just gonna be a series of questions um, that I'm not gonna elaborate on because it's confidential, but like it's gonna be a series of questions that they basically answer. Um, so yeah, so that's basically how that works. Um, with regards to the references, as soon as you submit the reference, then like you'll actually get an email to notify you that they've actually submitted their reference. So you will be aware, like if you haven't gotten a confirmation that they've like sent their reference, that is your indication to send us an email. And I'm just going to put like our general, um, most of you guys will be familiar with this, but just in case you're not, 
I'm going to put that into the chat so that everyone knows this is the email that you want to reach out to. Like, let's say your references have not submitted, you haven't gotten any indication that they have submitted their um, their reference, then that's the email you reach out to and say, hey, like I sent the reference form like a week ago or two weeks ago, and I still haven't received anything like a notification. That's the reference form that you uh, that's the email that you want to contact to let them know. Um, okay, so let's go back to Joyce. <laughs> um, so Joyce, we have a question here that's career related. Have any past graduates of this program become product managers in Canada? Is there a big demand for product managers in Canada? Good question. Um, product managers, I, I'm i pretty sure so, but I, like, usually when I say yes, I want to be able to see the person's face and the job and the company they go with. So I cannot see the face, or but I do know there are product managers and there are a lot of product managers roles. Like I, I just went on Google and I just typed product managers roles in Canada. And the first one I got was a technical one where they looking for people with an MBA or a master's degree um, and have technical skills and no machine learning and uh, data. So there is product manager is definitely a role that I have coached students with. Um, so there are students that are looking to go into product ma managers role and there are definitely students that have. Um, I would definitely encourage you to um, uh, go on LinkedIn and see. Um, happy to also help um, connect you with people if need to. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, now, one thing I always like advise students to do is like a little bit of research into mm -hmm. what their career goals are and what they want to get out of the program. Do you have any additional advice like to students approaching their application about like the type of research that they can do in terms of um, you know, assessing like what they can get out of an analytics degree and what their future career outcomes might look like? Yeah, I love that question. Um, just like that's a the, um, the strategy is very much the same as when you're looking for a job. So looking for a program that you want to study or looking for a job that you want to work in or a company you want to work in. And the best best research, research you can do is talk to the people who've done it. So we have a lot of great alumni that are ready to talk to our students because they've been where you've been. And so if, if for all the people who are our audience today, if you have not talked to an MBAN alumni, I encourage you to reach out to two or three and um, set up a virtual coffee chat, 15 minutes, just to um, ask them questions. And you can find them on LinkedIn and see their um, their work experience. And I see a lot of people asking about like, what if you don't have any work experience? Find, find alumni that had no work experience and talk to them, ask them what was it like getting into the MBAM program? How was the MBAM program? And what was it like to look for a job without the experience, right? Um, because I feel like that's the best research you can do um, to understand uh, what the program can give you, um, the experiences and what the outcome will be. Um, so do a little bit of research to find out. And if there is an area that you are really interested, for example, um, for the person who is interested in product manager, manage, yeah, manager role, um, be sure to find um, someone in product manager, whether it be an alumni or not an alumni, and ask them what is the role like? And what are some of the skill sets that the company is looking for or the industry is looking for in this in this type of role and see, okay, this is what they need. And you know what the MBAM program, the courses that you'll be learning, um, Vivian showed the kind of the schedule and the types of courses and the course titles, you'll have an idea, okay, am I gonna get this from this MBAM program? And if you're like, hey, this is, I wanna talk to someone to find out, again, talk to alumni and just say, tell me about this Python class. Tell me about this data visualization. What do you actually learn? And are you actually using these skill sets in the current job that you're working in? So that would be my advice. Yeah. So I guess a little bit on some of these programming languages is a question like what specific software tools or programming languages does the program emphasize and how do these choices align with current industry demands? Um, beyond technical skills, how does the program foster soft skills um, and how's the alumni network? That's a, a lot of questions. It's a multi-layer question from Stila in the chat. <laughs> so I kind of know if you wanted me to repeat any of that. Okay, I'll try and go through and then if I miss anything, you can let me know. So sure. for the alumni network, I just mentioned it. The alumni are really eager and excited to help anyone that have questions. Um, the graduating class have already come to me like many times on different occasions and saying, hey, 
Do you guys need guest speakers? Do you guys need alumni? Um, I would love to share my experiences. So reach out to um, our alumni on LinkedIn and I guarantee you they will reply to you and they will connect with you. If you don't hear back from them right away, it's just because they might be very busy with whatever they're working on, um, but it's not because they don't want to help you because I know for a fact they do. Um, so I would say the alumni network is perfect. It's, it's great. It's great. Um, and then you had another question about... Um, the, like the software skill, like the kind of, I guess the programming skills, like programming languages, like I talk about this as well, like ideally getting to like intermediate level on Python and R, um, which whether like through your university coursework, or if you don't have that, you can do it through things like Coursera and Data Camp, like that's acceptable too. Um, mm -hmm. But like any, anything else you would mention on like the programming um, languages that the, the program like yeah. emphasizes? So um that's probably more an RHL question than my question. But what I can say and what how I coach my, the students is that there's so many languages and there's so many platforms and softwares. Um, there's no way that MBAM program is going to teach you all, everything and anything you ever need to get into that area. But what I'm going to say is the program does teach you enough that if this, if you go into an interview or you see a job posting that talks about a, a language that you don't know yet, Google it, find out what it is and, and you know what it entails. And then in the interview, you can say, hey, I don't have this per this particular language, but I have learned this. If I can learn this, guarantee you I can learn this as well, right? Because so it's just, it's kind of like a track record, right? Your historical um, kind of your, it's kind of like a resume while we want to see your accomplishment statements and what experiences you have, because we know if you've done in the past there, you're going to be able to trans transfer those skill sets over here, right? Um, and a lot of companies are looking, I like that question too about soft skills, because a lot of companies will tell you, uh, if they know you can learn technical skills and they've seen it, especially if you do the MBAM program, what they're looking for is actually soft skills. Cause a lot of technical skills, they can teach you, um, but soft skills, it's, um, it takes a little longer to, um, a groom, I guess you can say. So, um, in terms of soft skills, how the program um, helps you, we do have lots of mock interviews. We talk about, we have uh, emotional intelligence uh, as one of the sessions that we teach in the BA 520. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we do work on your soft skills. There's lots of presentations, group work, ability for you to, you know, um, learn how to work with different people from different parts of the world, um, with different um, work ethics, cultures, lots of different ways for you to really work on those soft skills in the MBAM program, whether it be through the academic side or through the career side. Mm -hmm. And I always tell students that like the program kind of sits at this intersection between like a business degree, like a, almost like an MBA, like a data science program, and you yeah. smash it together and like you have 12 months. And what comes out is actually something that is very highly in demand, because yes. it takes kind of the best of the both worlds, right? You understand the data science, but you also understand business. And that's exactly what a lot of organizations are hungry for right now. Um, Joyce and I were just recently at like an employer appreciation event for all the employers that hired our interns. And they were really raving a lot about the type of skill set that our students have being in this intersection between data science and business. And like, and it is really just a really in demand field right now. So this a lot of people, I, I guess a lot of students have a lot of questions about like, is this a data science program? Is this a business program? And I say, actually, it's kind of in that intersection in both areas. And that yes. is actually very valuable. So I don't know if you have more to add to that, but I've always picked up that this is a really valuable intersection for business these days. Yeah, absolutely. I have lots of students that are worried about, you know, the, the labor market saying, hey, is things slowing down? Is there a, you know, like, are there going to be jobs? But the one thing I tell them in data, there is no shortage of jobs. All all companies need people to be able to understand data, be able to pull data and understand and clean data and then be able to tell that story. What insights are they actually t telling us, right? Telling the business and what can the business um, people, leaders be doing with this data? So absolutely, um, it's, a, it's a growing, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, growing field or yeah. um, industry skill, really. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Um, so I'm getting a lot. I'm just going to switch back to some of these um, uh, more kind of admission related questions. I got a question here about like how to connect with the student advisor. So I'm just going to put this QR code back onto the screen so everyone can take a look here. Um, 
and so this is like basically the screen where you can kind of um, see, like basically scan this to connect with our student ambassadors as well as our um, attend the next MBAN event. Um, and then let me just take a look here. Um, so how likely is someone to get someone to get accepted with no work experience as a fresh undergrad? What percentage of students are um, accepted um, joined right after their undergrads. So I don't have a percentage and, and we're not really having a quota with like students like from a certain background or a certain level of work experience. It's just about fit. You know, if you're a younger student and you don't have any work experience, what we're gonna be really looking for is a strong sense of self-awareness and goal setting that we know that you know what you're getting yourself into and that you're ready to benefit from the program and leverage what you learn into defined kind of career goals that make sense. So that kind of career goal setting is what we look across candidates from all different backgrounds, but it's going to be particularly important for students with, um, you know, coming directly from an undergrad to have that self-awareness um, of what they're going to get out of the program. So we don't have percentage, we don't have quotas, um, we're just looking for candidates that are ready to benefit from this type of training program. The SCM, okay, so this question is about the SCMP program, they've taken a look at the website already. Do students need a GMAT score to join or is GRE acceptable? Now, typically speaking with SCMP, they're looking for a GMAT score score of 700 or higher. Now, if you have a different type of score or you have questions about that, they do a run information session. So I did put the SCMP website on the chat. So feel free to grab that website and join their next information session or um, send them an email. And um, that will be a good way for you to figure out um, that particular question. I think we might have to end our session. Um, ah, I believe okay. there is another session that's going to be jumping on shortly. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you.